thank you guys for coming. We appreciate you getting here early, even though I know there's breakfast. Um, takes a little extra effort to come. Uh, and on top of that, there's more food out there if you want some more. So we appreciate you coming, and we're glad that Dawn got up early. So they are excited to hear what you have to say. I'm excited to tell them. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning, guys. Um, I, I, you know, as we kick off here, I know we were having some conversations you know, just a little bit ago, but uh, my name is Don Martin. I'm the regional manager for Power Service Products. There you go. This is my spot right here. Uh, regional manager for Power Service Products based out of Kansas City. And the one thing that we really wanted to do today is talk about some simple tips and some instruction as far as what CCO and power service is doing to prepare for the upcoming winter. I think that before uh, we get into it, our number one goal at CCO and at power service is to make sure that between not just October and March, but year round, that you guys have the confidence that you're buying the best, highest performing, most technologically advanced diesel fuel in the market today. We want it trouble free and we do not want downtime. Those are the things that we are striving for day in and day out. Uh, I know that uh, we are going to save towards the end, let's just say in the last 15 minutes, we will uh, save that for some Q&A. So if you have questions, just kind of shelf them for now. And uh, those of you that are uh, tapped in virtually, just save those questions for uh, later towards the, the end of the presentation, we'll get to them. Uh, with that, did you want me to? I'll go ahead and do it so I don't have to tell you next slide. The topics that we're going to go over, uh, this is thanks to Mr. Dave Head. We are going to, uh, I, I, I'm excited to do this presentation because it's one that I've never done in this particular format, but we're going to make sure that we show you guys exactly what our fuels are doing right now from a testing performance perspective. I want to be able to show you guys exactly what the additive is doing with the fuel that we have right here in our backyard in Topeka. And I want to be able to show you guys some blending comparisons with number one. I double treat with the additive. I want to be able to show you guys for the last two or three weeks what this fuel is doing right now and what the additive is doing. The CCO winter product lineup will show you what makes our winter diesel program. Uh, you know, Scott mentioned we we're talking about fuel and tank maintenance as far as being a pillar of success in the winter months. I can't stress this piece enough. The fuel marketers that have partnered with Power Service that are most successful are the guys that are doing this right here on a regular basis, if not quarterly at the very least. And then finally, to wrap up, we'll have tips for winter success. So, as I mentioned, I, I think that this slide cuts, you know, right to the front of the presentation is without a doubt probably the most important slide that most of you want to see from, from some of the questions we fielded so far. This was the data that you wanted to take a look at. Uh, Dave and the guys at CCO got me a sample uh, first part of October. I think it was the October 7th, October 8th. So this is a, uh, a representative look at what the fuel right here in Topeka is doing. And I'll, I'll give you guys a, a breakdown on everything that we're doing at our lab to make sure we know everything about this particular number two diesel in our market. This line here is the fuel sample that we received untreated. <coughs> we always want to get our samples untreated so that we can then add the appropriate additive blends as well as formulate uh, blends with number one. But this is the base number two. First column, you see the cloud temperature. Cloud temperature isn't necessarily going to be relating to performance. It is more of a benchmark that allows us to see how much wax or how much paraffin is present in the fuel. It gives us an idea on whether or not that fuel has been blended. 
This is right in line as from a cloud perspective, as well as a CFPP perspective, this is right in line with what the fuels in the Midwest should be doing. The next column is CFPP. That is the cold filter plugging point. This is the temperature that from a power service perspective, this is the temperature that we find the most beneficial. This is the one that we're really looking at from an operability perspective. This is the temperature at which a fuel will no longer flow through a prescribed filter. Four point temperature, you know, at that point, I don't really think that matters to us. That's the temperature at which the fuel is not going to pour out of a jar. And at that point, things are, you know, we're in too late of a, a scenario for a four point issue if we've met it. Water content, HFRR, this is lubricity spec, API gravity. We can identify if we have any soy methyl ester or biodiesel present, which obviously this is zero, which is good. Cetane number, uh, very high for uh, the national average. 53 is, uh, is a really good number. And cetane is analogous with octane and gasoline. So the higher this number in our diesel fuel, the, the more efficiently and completely our fuel is going to burn. The higher that number, the more robust the fuel and the, the quicker the, uh, the combustion will take place. It's a combustion improver, essentially. Moving on to the same sample, we wanted to look at what the uh, data would show from a single feed rate of our cold flow uh, package in the winter months. We hit it one time with a single feed rate, which is one gallon of additive to 1,500 gallons of fuel. We're not altering the cloud point because our products, this product in particular, does not contain any cloud point depression. So you're not going to see any movement from a cloud point perspective. But what you will see is a 32 degree depression from 12 degrees down to minus 22 as far as the CFPP is concerned. And that's, that's moving the fuel considerably. We were really happy with that single feed rate result. I don't know the, the last time that we were 22 below in this part of Kansas, but uh, we feel pretty comfortable with this number going into uh, the winter months. Granted, these fuels are gonna change almost on a weekly, bi-weekly basis. So it's definitely our, our mission to pull these samples as often as we can throughout the winter months to make sure that there aren't any big changes. But for right now, this is the snapshot we're looking at. <clears throat> if we did a, if we needed a scenario where we needed more additive, or if we saw the uh, a record setting type of a weather event moving into Topeka, Lawrence, uh, Eastern Kansas, and we wanted to double the feed rate, we're gonna get an additional nine degrees of depression on the CFPP. As you can see, the more additive that we add, we're starting to uh, max out as far as the concentration level and the, uh, the retention of that fuel being able to take additional additive. But we're able to get a little bit more depression than our single feed rate, and we're quite happy with 31 degrees below zero. Now, before I get into the blending, I, I want to give you guys a, a little behind the scenes on the CFPP and just give you a, an understanding of these temperatures. Number one, the biggest question that I always get is, Don, with all these tests, what kind of filters are you using in the lab? This is a 40, because it is an ASTM certified cold flow analysis, ASTM has a 45 micron fuel filter that they use for this test. With a show of hands, how many of you are operating on a 45 micron filter on your equipment? Okay, no one. The tolerances have increased and we can't, we can't accommodate or we cannot uh, replace that value of a of, of, of fuel sitting in a fuel storage tank overnight without any fuel recirculation, okay? And I also know that you're looking at, even from a cap perspective, <clears throat> two microns, five micron fuel filter elements. Those holes are really, really small when it's really cold, okay? So we have to really take these numbers with a grain of salt. This gives us on the team a really good indicator on what the fuel's doing, but it is not a 100% you know, accurate type of real world situation. So I want all of you to be aware of that. Uh, 
as we look at the comparisons, uh, you know, Dave and the team at CCO wanted to look at our options for you guys. Number one, diesel, if we can get it, is going to be extremely expensive in the winter months. Not only that, but it has changed as far as its ability to prevent fuel from gelling and lowering the CFPP in the winter months. Ultra low sulfur K doesn't do what it used to. And, and if probably a few of you missed this, but maybe 10 minutes ago, we were talking about the old school number one diesel. A 50 50, 60 40 blend between number one and number two back <laughs> in the day, you're probably good down to 30 below. No questions asked. Today, with all of the EPA changes to the fuels, not just with the number two, but with the number one as well, we're not getting nearly as much depression as what we did in years past. The, I think the adage that I've heard and that I continue to hear over the last 10 years from a number one perspective is this, for every 10% of number one that you use, you can expect a depression from a CFPP perspective of anywhere from three to five degrees. So this is, this is holding fairly true. But for every 10% that you utilize and that you put in your plan, you're going to get three to five degrees of depression. The questions that we have to be asking ourselves is, is that worth it? You know, in January and December, our delta between number one and number two diesel might be 25 cents. You know, so there's, there's considerable cost going into that fuel program. And it's a very abrasive product. It's very dry. Um, these are numbers that we were able to find from an 80-20, and keep in mind, this is untreated. There are customers that we have that will do both, that will do an 80-20 plus the single feed rate of additive. If you're living in Fargo, North Dakota, then maybe you're doing a 70-30 with a double, depending on the fuel. But again, I think this slide is most important because it gives you an idea of where we want to finish as a company. This is precisely the fuel that we want to be able to deliver you guys and have a trouble-free winter. Uh, keep in mind, this is, I, I wanted to make sure that, that you guys saw this right off the bat to kind of start the day. What we'll do now is, any questions on this before I, before I move it on? What we need to do now is understand what got us here. What are the things that CCO and the power service is doing to get to those numbers? What are the things behind the scenes that we're doing to ensure that you guys get the best, most robust winter fuel that we can get you? We have to understand the fuel itself. All of us continue to hear the acronym ULSD, ultra low sulfur diesel. The short story is that the EPA has <laughs> taken out the majority, if not all of the sulfur within the diesel fuel in order to clean up our air and our water, which I'm 100% in favor for. What I will tell you is that sulfur is a wonderful thing for a diesel engine and for a fuel. It's a great lubricant, and it's a very good carrying agent for moisture in a fuel system. So when I went from, in 2010, when I went from a 500 part per million sulfur diesel fuel down to 15, what started happening? We started to see issues with pumps, injectors. It's a very, very dry fuel, so we started seeing issues from a, an equipment perspective. What really popped up, and I don't think anybody was really anticipating, is that sulfur is a natural poison for bacteria and fungus. You won't have a farm fuel or a, a fuel that's been sitting in a construction tank. You won't have that fuel grow bacteria and fungus if you've got a lot of sulfur in it. Bugs don't like it. So that 500 to 15 ppm sulfur move back in 2010 opened the door, not only for more free water to start falling out of this fuel, <coughs> but that water in itself has oxygen, so therefore you're getting a huge support from a life support system and growing bacteria and fungus. That's before we can even talk about taking care of injectors or taking care of pumps or preventing fuel from gelling. We'll get into uh, the tank maintenance piece, but 
as you can see, there was a lot for us to learn. I think the entire additive market itself had to go back to the drawing board and figure out the tank maintenance piece first and then build their additives accordingly to how they were going to prevent fuel from gelling and how they were going to improve performance in the non winter months. So with these changes, we've got reduced sulfur and aromatics. We've got higher wax. What's it mean? At the end of the day, we are, we're seeing more gelling related issues earlier at higher temperatures. As I mentioned, with the shorter supply of ultra low sulfur K, we don't know if we can get it. And do we want it if we can? Having a premium hold flow or CFI program in place is the direction that we've decided to go because we don't want to be in limbo with our cold flow program. The cold flow or the CFI that we're utilizing at CCO is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to modify the paraffin at a molecular level, modify the wax particles and prevent them from agglomerating, prevent them from sticking together so they don't plug up filters and you're starting at 4 a.m. <laughs> to 5 a.m. every morning without a beat, not having an issue. Treated on the right, untreated on the left. And as I mentioned, because the fuel is so destabilized, we really have to change our chemistries on an annual basis to make sure that we're keeping up with all of the fuel changes that are taking place, uh, you know, not just since 2010, but you know, on an annualized basis. The product that we are using behind the scenes to promote the CCO premium diesel program in the winter months is diesel fuel supplement. I'm sure that some of you in here have probably seen the package goods that we have at your, your Napa's, your Pet Boys, O'Reilly's, Porcelain Farm and Home. It is the most notable, if not the most popular cold flow agent on the market today. The big guy in the background is a concentrated formula that we utilize at CCO. It's a one to 1500 feed rate. And it, even though it contains the same ingredients, it is a much more beefy, more concentrated product so that we can treat larger quantities of diesel fuel. In this package, it's very simple. We have the, you know, the majority of the chemistry within this drum is built to prevent fuel from gelling. We do have two points of cetane in this package. And again, that's a combustion improver that aids in faster cold starts. You know, the cetane, just real quick technical piece, cetane has an auto ignition temperature of 212 degrees. So as soon as my combustion chamber is getting that, that compressed air up to 212, as soon as I, as soon as I get a, a nice fine spray pattern going into that combustion chamber, as I'm coming up to top center, I get a huge power stroke coming down and I'm, I'm burning all of that fuel more efficiently on that power stroke. So it's aiding in the combustion and it's also more efficiently burning the fuel. Really helps out with the cold starts. The last piece, Slick diesel without sulfur present in these fuels today, as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more instances where these drier fuels are harming vital engine parts, namely injector tips and pumps. Slick diesel, you will find, uh, it's kind of hard to see with the graininess of the screen, but you'll see slick diesel logos basically with every performance product that we're manufacturing. Diesel Clean in the summer has it, Diesel Fuel Supplement in the winter has it, and Diesel 911 for a winter emergency also has it. So three components, CFI, cetane, split diesel, and one I forgot, we have a little de-icer in there as well to make sure that our, our filters are protected between March and October, excuse me, October and March. As we, you know, and again, I'm, I'm working backwards here. 
everything that we're trying to do behind the scenes is to get to that 21 to 22 below CFPP. The one thing that I think is the most important and, and Kyle and Dave and everybody on the CCO team has heard me talk about this from day one and it is extremely important not just for the success of CCO and power service, but for you guys as too. We have to have some type of tank hygiene program in place. We have to make sure that not only the storage and equipment tanks that we have <coughs> on site are free of water and or bacteria and fungus. This is, in my opinion, the most challenging part of our business. If we don't have robust tank maintenance programs or protocols in place. None of these, you know, big Cummins logos or this big power service brand, none of this makes any difference. It doesn't matter how good your coal flow is. It doesn't matter if it's good to 40 below. If you've got water, bacteria, and fungus in your storage or equipment tanks, you're gonna fail at 15 degrees. We won't have the luxury of being able to get to a 22 below or a 15 below. Because what temperature does water freeze? 32. Our filters are much finer. They're much smaller than they've ever been in our lifetime. They're doing their job. What are they collecting? Moisture, contaminants. In January, if we step outside and it's zero, and that's, that's possible for this country, what do you think is gonna happen? It's not gonna be the fuel that fails. It'll be these other pieces of the fuel and tank maintenance program that we may have missed that reach up and kind of bite us in the butt. Microbial issues that are relating to water cause corrosion and obviously OEMs across the board want all of our fleets to have some type of program in place. Even at twice a year, we'll talk about the ins and the outs on how we do that. But my point is that at CCO, we know this is so important for the success that we're about to have going from October to March. Any questions on the tank maintenance piece? Quick picture that I, I pulled from the Steel Tank Institute, just to kind of give you a visual. I'm, I know this is underground and it's not gonna be something that's relating to of your tanks, but it, it still gives us an idea of headspace. It gives us an idea of, you know, where we're pulling fuel from on the bottoms. It gives us an idea, especially if it's an above ground tank, you know, although this one's not. If we've got water, potentially bacteria and fungus in an above ground tank, how would it have gotten there? You know, picture that above ground storage tank half full. Half of that tank's exposed internally. It's got headspace, it's got air. Sun comes up in the morning, warms up that tank, cools off at night, especially in the fall. This is when all this is happening. Sun goes down, cools everything up. You might not have even pulled the nozzle to that tank. You may have not even opened that tank, but it is consistently creating condensation. What is heavier, fuel or water? Water, all day long. It creates moisture in the headspace, drips down the sidewalls of the tank, and before you know it, you've got two, four, six inches of water. So that's why a quarterly type of a approach is best. Even though we're not bringing fuel that is entrenched in water, it's creating moisture on its own, and we know that. So just gives you kind of an idea of all of the ways in which water, at least from a below ground tank perspective, can infiltrate a tank. This is not what we want to see. I see it a lot. Uh, it, it is just, it's just the nature of the beast, guys. This will be something that as long as we're in this business, as long as you're around diesel equipment and diesel fuel, these are things that we hope not to see, but they're out there every day, all day. Water and excrement, obviously, 
the heaviest parts of this mixture on the bottom. The part where the bugs love it the most is this microbial interface. They can pull nutrients from the fuel column above, and then they can pull oxygen from the water below. They've got a perfect setup and no sulfur to, you know, to kill them or to not provide a food source. As I mentioned before, what do you think, and I think it's more representative if we turn this sample on its side to kind of represent, a, let's say, a 10,000 gallon above ground storage tank. What if this fuel right here, and you know, we did all our testing, Don, what's the, you know, what's the Topeka fuel good to 20 below? Great. Let's say that this fuel is good to 20 below zero. And we wake up in January and it's 10 degrees outside. That fuel is going to be fine, but I guarantee you, you will encounter challenges at the filter because of this right here. It might not be your fault, but it'll be a problem. Now, we're doing all of these things behind the scenes to make sure that we are doing all that we can to dehydrate these fuels. We're using biocides on a quarterly basis to make sure that when it gets to you guys, we're good to go. What we need is at least just the knowledge that this could be occurring. And I'm sure you know which storage tanks these might be. You probably don't even want to look in some of these tanks. But I, I really advise you guys to, to do it now. Uh, the spring and, and most importantly, the fall is the time to do these types of checks with your fuel system to make sure that when we get into December, we don't have to worry about it. If we did have a situation like that previous slide, that's a pretty bad scenario. And I I've, I've seen better, I've seen worse. But if we get into a scenario where we've got a lot of water, we know we're positive for bacteria and fungus, we'll use two products to get rid of it. <coughs> the reason that we're utilizing two chemistries is because these bugs encase themselves in their own excrement. They, they, they protect themselves with like a protective slime layer. That's what ends up breaking off and plugging fuel filter elements at the worst times. We need to expose that bacteria in order to kill it. That's the pesticide. This is our dual phase biocide called BioClean. And it will take paint off the side of a barn. It is nasty stuff. We use clear diesel fuel and tank cleaner to disperse those fuel contaminants, to disperse that slime layer and expose them to the BioClean, which kills them. Not every time do we have to recommend two products, but in heavy contamination situations, it's, it's needed. Take for instance, if I just used BioClean and I had a really heavy contamination issue, I'm going to kill the bugs. I have no doubt that I'm going to be able to kill every living organism in that fuel storage system. But BioClean is not going to dissolve or just miraculously remove all of those contaminants from the tank. I need something that breaks them up and allows them to be either pumped off or drained off, whatever the case may be, depending on the severity of the issue. But in really a severe contamination issues, we have to utilize both products together. And so far, they're, they're doing wonderful things together. I, I know that as soon as Ultra Low was introduced back in 2010, this was the part of our business that just really skyrocketed. And I think every additive company can probably say that. We were dealing with bacteria issues across the board. We, we couldn't even have a discussion about cold flow or increasing acres per hour or miles per gallon. We had to, we had to kill bugs and clean up tanks first. And it's still going on. So these two products are the ones that we utilize for severe systems just like that. The clear diesel, as I mentioned, it's all about dispersing fuel contaminants, removing or at least breaking up that water and the slime, exposing the bite of the microbes to the biocide for a quicker, more complete kill. Al, is this the one that you had utilized for a preserver? Yeah. <laughs> about a week ago. Yeah, a lot of, 
we were we were having this conversation earlier, and you know the bio side market is is very expensive. It doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. Bio sides are built to do one thing, and that's that's kill living organisms. Well, that that's not cheap chemistry. What we found that if we can dehydrate a fuel storage system four times a year by using this product. Using this product four times a year is still cheaper than using this product once. This is never really any fun to deal with because when somebody calls me and they need to get BioClean, I know they're in a jam. I know they have a problem. After we've killed bacteria and cleaned up the individual's or the customer situation, that's when we have this discussion about clear diesel. If I can control the water in the storage and in the equipment, I can make sure that we don't have bugs or I can at least greatly minimize those chances of occurring. You starve the fuel of oxygen, you're not going to have as many or robust bacteria uh, scenarios. Again, dual phase, this is an 86% active chemistry. I was thinking about it this morning, whenever I parked out front, it was 39 degrees outside. And I think it's very important that you guys know this. This product and most biocides like this are extremely concentrated. What does that mean? On a morning like this, had I left this bottle outside on the back porch at 39, it's going to be a solid at 39 degrees, I can assure you. When I was in the warehouse as a kid, that was one of our jobs. When it got cold in Texas, and it doesn't normally do that, but my job was to get on a forklift and pick up totes of this product and stop and go, stop and go before it would ship because it, it would get so chilly that this product would start getting viscous. It's not bad that the product's doing that. It just shows you how concentrated it is. So if you need to use it or if you've got it in the shop, make sure you're keeping it at least 50, 55 degrees or warmer. If a driver or somebody leaves it outside and it does free up, it won't hurt the product. It's just not going to be able to properly mix into the fuel. So bring it inside for a couple hours, allow it to go back into the liquid form, and it'll be fine. But I, I get this call at least, you know, five or ten times a year. Hey, man, I bought the product that you told me to, and I'm, I got the cap open, and, and there's nothing coming out. It looks like, you know, molasses. What's up? It's so concentrated, it doesn't, we didn't want to miss and take up a lot of room with solvents and things that make these products flow. We wanted to make sure that once they got into the fuel, they killed everything that they touched. So, very important slide here as well. If we find issues, and I know that we've done this process at CCO with customers downstream or you know, in our own experience, this is the step-by-step -step approach that we have. <clears throat> the gallon container that I showed you on this slide will treat 2,500 gallons of fuel. They come in four per case, so a case would treat a perfect 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel. Their diesel is added at a rate of one gallon to 500 gallons of fuel so that we can really uh, maximize the amount of water that we're breaking up and the slime that we're displacing. Very important to fill up that storage tank after adding the products. Don't fill up the tank and then put the products in and walk away thinking that you're good to go. That's we don't have any agitation there. Uh, and, and the products are you know, from a bioclean perspective, they're they're too pricey uh, to just dump in on top and, and hope that everything goes well. Put the products in first, fill up the tank after that, making sure that you're encasing every square inch of the inside of that storage tank because those bugs are going to be high they're going to be low this is this is very important piece of this puzzle testing and treating afterwards just to make sure that we're in good shape and as i mentioned twice a year at minimum it's when we should be looking at, at water or, or testing our tanks or 
you know, calling Scott, calling Dave, whoever, and saying, hey, let's, let's pull a sample of this tank just to make sure we're good here. One thing that I, I, as we get into winter, I want to make sure that we have at least a brief discussion on diesel 911. How many of you in here are familiar with this product? It's one that there's a lot of folks across the country are very familiar with. It's been around for going on 64 years. And it is a product that is designed to do one thing and that's reliquify gel fuel or de-isofrozen fill filter. It is not an anti-gel. We have so, and we get it, 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 this is a good problem to have, but we have heard and seen so many success stories with this product getting people off the side of the road that they think they'll go back, you know, a couple of years later, they'll think, man, I remember 911 got me out of a jam. Why don't I just start adding that in with, with my other additive? Not recommended. It is safe for use in any application, but we want to make sure that we're using it for the right application, which is an emergency type of an application. Directions for use, remove the frozen fuel filter, fill it up you know, halfway with 911, reinstall, let it idle. You know, Dave and I talked about it yesterday. I, I've always given guys this instruction and go inside back to the barn or you know, into the shop and have a cup of coffee. And when you come back, each time I've given the recommendation, our you know, tractors are firing off is a, a product to definitely have in the toolkit. Either in the cab, make sure your drivers, even yourself, have got one or two. It's cheap insurance. So it, it's jumper cables. It, you know, it's your toolbox. It, it is a nice, it doesn't take up a lot of room, and it will definitely take care of you if you get into a jam. So, to kind of recap the winter, you know, going backwards from our fuel analysis report, we're getting there with the use of this cold flow agent, diesel fuel supplement. If we're below 30 degrees, this is when we start using that product. Now, you'll see on the next slide, there's a recommendation saying to calendar treat versus temperature treat. And my point on that is that at CCO, we choose a particular time of the year to start adding or switching over to our cold flow chemistry. Usually that number is October the 1st, October the 15th, but we are in the process of transitioning all of our customer base from a summer performance type fuel into a winter operability fuel. But from a retail perspective, obviously, we, we want to make sure that that cold flow agent is entrenched with the fuel when those temperatures start to take a dip. 911 on hand, and then these two products for any type of tank maintenance needs. So I, I think we'll spend some time on, uh, on this slide. But as you can see, kind of the <coughs> tips for winter success. Most importantly, check these storage tanks at least twice a year, guys. Uh, if, if you've got water, bacteria, or fungus, call us. Get it out of there. You know, uh, pump it off. Drain it off. Whatever you can do, get that out of the fuel system. The first thing that goes when we get a cold snap. Have some extra filters on hand. Uh, Changing these more often between October and March. I, it never fails. The first few sales calls or the infield calls that I'll have in the next 30 to 60 days, I'll roll up to a storage tank and guys always like to mark the dates on their filters. It never fails. I'll go up there and they'll be eight, nine, 10 months old on the filters. I'm like, man, we, I mean, we, we have to be able to you know, have a little bit to work with when we start getting cold. So change those things out. They're going to do their job. And if they get filled up, uh, it only takes you know, 20 to 15 degrees for those to be solid from a, from a moisture perspective. The only equipment tanks up at night or after the shift. This will, this will help remove or eliminate that headspace in the top of the tank. 
and a calendar treat versus the temperature treat. This is very important. We dedicate ourselves to the calendar on how we're treating. I have never seen a program that's been successful at looking at Gary Lezak's seven day forecast and thinking, ooh, it's gonna get cold this weekend. I better start treating my stuff. Those responses and those reactions do not go well. We start early to make sure that all of our fuel is treated downstream. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you're burning 500 gallons a day or if you're burning 500 gallons every 90 days. We want to make sure that we are treated and that you guys have a top to bottom cold flow approach from October to March. And always keep diesel 911 on hand for emergencies. Uh, any questions on these tips? I think that we can spend a little bit of time as we kind of transition into the, the Q&A part, but any questions on experiences that you guys have seen? Uh, have any, has anybody in the room utilized some of these tips? Yes, no? Yes. Which ones? What? Which ones? The, key the key. equipment filled up at Four. night. Yeah. Water. It's with today's fuel as unstable as it is, and with all of the variables that we have in front of us, having an insurance plan like a 911 is extremely cheap and it it minimizes downtime. That that's kind of what we've coined with 911. Minimizing downtime is, is priority one for us, especially in the winter months. So having that on hand is, is extremely important. Um, doing in pretty good shape with time, guys. Let's kind of open this up to <coughs> questions. Give me your thoughts moving forward. Any questions on, yes, sir? The ratio when you're doing your 911, usually a quart does like 100 gallons. Correct. If you go beyond that, what does that really do? Does it help you, hurt you, or? You know, we really like to stay within that recommendation. Um, you know, obviously with all of the testing that we do, you know, knock on wood, we've never had any downstream problematic issues with engines with 911. We don't plan on it just because we know what that threshold is. We've seen, I mean, and I've witnessed it multiple times in Minnesota, North Dakota, when it gets cold, Guys will take 911 and they'll think they're gel. A lot of times they could be, but a lot of times they're not. And it's usually an icing issue. They'll pour in a quarter 911 and maybe wait five minutes and there's no recirculation happening and they haven't changed the filter. And they think, well, one is good, two is going to be best. So we know that that mentality is there. If, if one doesn't work, then maybe two, maybe three. So We've built that product knowing that the consumer might get a little aggressive. And I don't blame him or her. If it's 10 below outside, you, you want to get going. You're not a happy camper if you're changing fuel filters at 10 below zero on your cab. It, that's not fun. But to answer your question, we've we've protected against that type of overtreatment. It will not, as long as we're not putting, you know, 5X, you know, the feed rate, then everything's going to be just fine. How about your normal uh, power serve when you're doing like treating your, like you're filling your, your diesel tank with uh, uh, the treat the 100 gallons? When you dump that in there, dump me more than that. What does that do? Well, it, it, it will depend on, it'll directly relate to what that fuel and how that fuel was treated before it got to you. Right. If, if the fuel's all already treated, and I've seen this and it doesn't harm anything, but what happens is your, it's kind of the law of diminishing returns. <laughs> Uh, you start kind of plateauing uh, just about, it depends on the fuel, but around a double feed rate or just over a double feed rate, the fuel will max out. It will, it will no longer be able to hold any of the cold flow or depress that CFPP. So just so everybody can kind of save money on this play, don't, don't think that more is better. Uh, you're going to max out at it, you know, probably a double feed rate. I've seen very few fuels where we can add a triple and it move. But if you look at, I mean, this is a great example. You start seeing the plateau effect right here with this fuel. It did very, very well at a single feed rate. 
but it only got us an additional nine degrees of compression <clears throat> on a, a one to 750 on a double. I bet you that if we were to triple treat this, it might move it one or two degrees more. And, and that's it. So your cost you know, has tripled, but has your performance and has your benefits tripled? And, and the answer is no. So when we feel a different, you know, we go out of state on nine runs and stuff. And um, I tell the guys when they're coming back when they're fueling, they treat before they leave the fuel that's in the tank. And then as they do their run, when they put their new fuel in, I have them put the additive and then the fuel. Um, what we're getting from the other, you know, places where we fuel, you know, I, I just don't do that like a half a ratio because the tank's been already treated for the full. So sure. is, that, is that? That's that, that's exactly the recommendation I would okay. give. Um, <clears throat> you never know what you're going to get right. on the road, especially at retail. Uh, there is a... Now, obviously a big biodiesel play at retail and and that will prove to be somewhat problematic in the winter months uh, it's great for increasing profits but it can be we've had very it. challenging in the winter we've had it it's kind of like uh summer fuel they have it in the winter and they try to use it all up and get hot yes so. yes you do yeah. any other questions guys so when I'm running the number one, because we sometimes when we get really um, harsh weather, we'll take and um, we on on site we have storage. We'll have like um, 500 gallons or so in our tank of number one, and I'll bring the trucks in after they get off the road and try to do a ratio of three quarters of like whatever they're getting out of the pumps, and then top it off like with a quarter of number one. Mm -hmm. With doing that. There's no sense of the additive or what's going to depend on the fuel. You know, if, it, if it's truly a, a, that would be a 75, 25 blend. Right. It's, it's really going to start with the DNA of the number two diesel fuel. Um, yes. What in, in my mentality, what, what blending does today that I think you didn't look at it this way in the past, but when you when I look at blending now, all this it says that yes, I'm I've got an 80% number two and a 20% number one. I look at it as I'm removing 20% number two. I'm removing 20% of the paraffin value in this mixture. So from that respect, I don't know exactly what's going to happen because I, I'm not sure what the base fuel is doing. But I mean, obviously I, I would want, I've got guys that use the additive in the winter months just for the lubricity. You know, in Alaska on the North Slope, none of our customers use cold flow because they're using straight number one. But they do use diesel clean, a summer product, doesn't have any cold flow in it at all, but they're using those products for lubricity for pumps and injectors. So if it's just protecting, you know, the harshness or against the harshness of number one, that's 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 pretty cheap insurance. Even if you if you think you've got a pretty nice cocktail from a number one, number two perspective, I'd still look at something you know, to improve that HFRR, that wear scar. And and normally when we do tests like this, uh, you know, think of this as a golf score. The higher it is, I mean, they'll, the the minimum from an EMA, uh, EMA perspective is four hundred and sixty micro. Well, we see fuels that are untreated all the time that are in the six and seven hundreds. No good. That's that's a pretty dry fuel. You throw a little bio in there and that'll go back down. Bio is a wonderful lubricant. But if you've just got an 80 percent number two and a 20 percent number one, that's probably going to have a fail. More than likely, that's going to be a fairly dry fuel. So needing uh, an additive that has that lubricity component is 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 very valuable well number one not the injectors out if you run too much of it or we we've seen that happen i mean it's it's pretty hot yeah and but there a bit keep in mind 10 15 years ago and, and it still happens today and i can't believe it i've still got guys that are putting a gallon of diesel fuel in with their, you know or a, ga a gallon of gas yes. on 100 gallons of diesel fuel and i i'm just like no no <laughs> that's that's not what we want with today's tolerances 
uh, and changed. yeah, we're working so closely with Cummins and, and kind of seeing these tolerances. It's a no, no, you'll be hot, but you, you might lose an engine in the process. Yes, sir, Kyle. Well, Don, your chart up here doesn't say it, but if we started with a, a single dose of number two, you're at minus 22. Yep, 22 on the safety page. That's pretty smart. You put the 80 20 blend of number one. Is that going to get you five more points like it did when you untreated the number two blend? I think it's I think it's safe to say I don't know. I would I would definitely need to to treat that and and we can do that on our next round. I think it's beneficial. Uh, but if it just glancing at it, if if we were able to get to twenty two below with the single feed rate and then we cut twenty percent of the number two out, I bet we would get at least yeah we'd get at least five more degrees. I mean I I would suspect anywhere from the 28 to minus 30 range that that's my guess I, I can't confirm that but uh you're you're really you're really improving not only the additives ability to lower the cfpp because you're taking out 20 percent of the paraffin if you can do that you're you know the fuel's really saying hey thanks uh you're replacing me with some additive and some one so i it's got the potential to go pretty low. Also, in your opinion, is it worth blending 10% number one? Is that just a waste of money? I, depends on the cost, you know. Uh, but yeah, I would I would certainly, I mean, we've, we've been very successful with showing these types of comparisons and, uh, you know, following through with the results as far as being trouble free in the winter months. Um, and being competitive, making sure that we're, we're holding on as much uh, cost as we can, and and not throwing it, not throwing it away with uh, you know having to spend it on number one. Yeah, and that's a forty-five micron. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't be false. Oh, no, great point. And it's not. Being falsely misled, is that the industry standard? Sure, exactly. I, there's nothing I can, yeah, nothing I can do about the makeup right. of these tests. You know, right. these are all the ones that every additive manufacturer has to follow. If it's going to be an ASTM certified test, that's what we have to use. Yeah. And yeah, and I don't like it, you know, because I've got, I've got fleets here. I've got, you know, tool buses. I got lots full of skid steers, and those aren't on 45s. And, and those are the guys that call me. Uh, they might have, and that's another thing that we can talk about. If we encounter a situation where we've got a few pieces of equipment that are giving us some problems, let's say we've got a fleet of you know, 25 pieces of equipment and it gets cold, I'm saying single digits, and five of them give us issues. Is that a fuel issue or is that potentially an icing issue? Anyone? Icing, probably. Yeah. Of course, it's icing. It's not the fuel. That's right. That's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, if it's a CCO or power service fuel, then it's not the fuel, right? But it, it those are the things that, that I talk to and talk through with customers. Is I, I'm, I'm happy to come out and take a look at this, but if we've got five pieces of equipment that are giving us headaches, they've all got the same fuel. Now, granted, I know that not every piece of equipment on the lot is going to be the same, but that tells us that there's something amiss with a couple of pieces of equipment. If the entire fleet's down, then yeah, we've got we've got another issue at hand. But those are the things that we'll see in the first cold snap. We'll find out what filters haven't been changed. We'll find out where water may be hiding in some of these storage or equipment tanks. And, and that's always a good time of the year because we know that we have the same fuel and the same additive and the same feed rate throughout our territory with, you know, throughout our customer base. And if we've got a handful or if we've got the majority of them up and running and screaming down the road, then we know something's working. And, and, and those are the things that we really look at, uh, especially, like I said, during that first cold snap, because that's, that's what will show us what improvements we might need to make downstream or things we need to address.
going a little bit overboard, guys, but is there any anything else? Any closing comments? Any questions? Yes, sir. At the end of the day, what does cloud point mean? Because it didn't change after you treated it. Thank you. It's you know, cloud is exactly what it sounds like. It is the temperature at which the fuel starts to become cloudy. And what that means more technically is the paraffin is starting to fall out of that fuel. And, and it'll happen anywhere. I've seen clouds as low as five degrees, the further north you go. And I've seen clouds, <laughs> there's, a, there's a fuel in this state that has a cloud of 16 degrees. And the sample that Dave is holding right there is a perfect indicator of a cloudy fuel. That's a zero degree. And, zero degree. And as, he, as he turns it back and forth, you can see that it's full. So it's not going to be directly related to an operability issue. It, it's more of a kind of a flag. It, it's the first thing. That's exactly why we put it in the first column. We want to know because of the cloud, how high the potential wax content might be. So we look at it as an indicator. Again, it's not something that matters to us when we get into the you know, months of December and January, and we you know, it's all about operability. This temper, temperature is just a an, indi an indicator on how well, how much paraffin's in the fuel, and not only that, how well our CFIs are working. The rule of thumb that we have, and I think this is across the board from the additive industry, if you've got an additive that can depress a fuel's, if, if you can depress the CFPP 20 degrees below the cloud, then you've got a functioning, not only do you have a good fuel that's receptive to the additive, but you've got a beefy additive technology that's designed to do one thing, and that's prevent fuel gel. 20 degrees is what we look at. We don't put that in writing or anything, but we that's what we talk about. That's what we're emailing back and forth with the lab. If we can get to a 20 degree depression, we feel like we're bringing some good technology to the table. And again, it's going to be dependent on that number two. You know, the fuel here is going to do different things from Kansas City and Des Moines and Nebraska. They're all different. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's kind of a moving target these days, which makes it challenging. But Again, kind of in summation, these are the things behind the scenes that we're doing uh, at CCO to make sure that you guys don't have to worry about it. But we do want you to be aware of ultra low, it's nature, and, and you know, some of the pitfalls that, that can come with water bugs, all those things. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Those of you online, oh, I'll let you clap. <laughs> uh, those of you online, thank you guys for, for uh, joining in so early. Thank you guys for coming out. We appreciate the business. Any questions, reach out to Dave, Kyle, Scott, the whole CCO crew. They'll get you fixed up. Uh, and that's it. You guys have a great day. We appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you.